I encourage each of you to read the bio in the program. Uh, I think it's telling the way his bio does not necessarily stress what has been done in the past, but it talks about what he's going to do in the future for the university and for South Carolina. Before he got to Carolina, he did serve 43 years in the military, including a uh, West Point graduate. And uh, he served his nation, uh, his cadets at West Point, and his soldiers over the years in an outstanding and selfless manner. I uh, found this interesting. It's a sport we don't have in South Carolina, but he skied when he was in high school on a ski team. And he also played football, and that's the reason he went to West Point, where he uh, was a football player for the Black Knights. His final Army assignment was as superintendent and president of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He led the college to recognition as the number one college, according to Forbes magazine and U.S. News and World Reports. During his career prior to getting to West Point, he held uh, positions of increasing responsibility and served throughout the world, including Iraq during Desert Storm and again in Iraqi Freedom. He served in Kosovo, Afghanistan twice. He earned the Defense and the Army Distinguished Service Medals, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merits, Bronze Stars, and the Combat Infantry Badge. He's airborne and air assault qualified. He holds advanced degrees from Long Island University, Kansas State, and graduated from the U.S. Army War College. He and Shelley have been married for 42 years, congratulations, and have three sons and four grandchildren. At this time, please, let's give a big Florence welcome to President Lieutenant General Bob Castle. created a park in honor of veterans and those who have served our nation who have stood in the gap to protect what our nation is all about. It says a lot about Florence, it says about, a lot about what your values are, and those of us that are veterans greatly appreciate that you have dedicated what you have over there. I know it's raining, we couldn't be over there, but Florence has this beautiful convention center right here, and we're able to gather in this room, for the most part, with some uh, with some separation distance and masks and all that sort of thing in the pandemic world, but it's really great to be with all of you uh, this morning. I want to give a very special thanks to a number of people. First of all, off to my left and right is a number of our board members, and I do want to rec recognize them because they're really great men and their spouses are phenomenal who have uh, represented our university for so many years. First of all, Dr. Floyd and his wife Kay, Jean and D.D. War, uh, the spouse of our chair, Dr. Dawn Smith, Debbie Smith, and a former board member, Mark and Julie Bike. So we're so honored. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. I also am very grateful to have to be here with our representative, Roger Kirby. And sir, thanks so much for your rendition of our national anthem and the honor that you had given our nation in a lot of this. Uh, I want to recognize Darren Dar Sasser, Reverend Calvin Robinson, sir, thank you. I know Walt Anderson is not here. His color guard is here. I'm not sure if they're still in the room, but they did a magnificent job. So thank you all very much, the color guard. And finally, to Colonel Barry Wingard. Thanks for hosting this and your great job that you're doing as our MC. And again, I want to thank all of you for being here and for inviting me to speak for this event. I noticed when we were singing the rendition of our armed forces that there were so many veterans that in the room that stood up for your respective service. And to our veterans and to our service members here today, thank you for your service. We stand in appreciation of the sacrifices that you've made and the examples of leadership that you bring to this great community. And to the families 
of those particularly who paid the last full measure of devotion to the events of our nation, a very special thank you and appreciation for your sacrifice as well. Here today, as in many communities across America, we pause to celebrate those who have worn the cloth of our nation and who serve so proudly in defense of the United States of America. Since the end of World War I, our nation has set aside this day to celebrate the men and women who served in our armed forces, defending our country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. From the Revolutionary War to our most recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan for more than 240 years, these men and women have answered the call of duty and of country and have carried out their duty with honor. One of the great leaders of, uh, of the 20th century, former President of the United States, Supreme Allied Commander of the European Theater in World War II, President Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, the history of freedom is never really written by chance. It is written by choice. America's choice of freedom manifests itself in our Constitution that says we the people. And we the people has always represented the ideals and principles of freedom. From the earliest days in our republic to today, we remain a people committed to freedom, tolerance, and inclusion of everyone. As President Eisenhower alluded to this, we have chosen this path to be free. But as you know, it's not without cost. Our freedoms and values are defended and maintained at a steep price. They're secured only through the blood and the sacrifice of brave men and women willing to confront the dangers of the world order to protect our values and our way of life. These faceless heroes have selflessly and continuously laid their sacrifice on the altar of freedom to allow us to enjoy the fruits of that freedom. I know you recognize that and appreciate what they do and what they have done over the years or you wouldn't be here today. And I'll tell you as a retired soldier with 43 years of service, it is an honor to be able to stand with you today and to talk about our veterans and their incredible service and sacrifice over so many years. If you ever have the opportunity to witness a veteran as they recite the Pledge of Allegiance or face the flag during the Star Spangled Banner, just watch them in the corner of your eye. The words are alive to them. The bond created between them and their country, represented by that flag, is a dull They know something about the concept of selfless service to one's nation and to the principles which set it free and for which it stands. They know it all too well. If you tour our nation's capital, you can't escape the tributes to generations past. Standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial is a beautiful reflecting pool. And at the opposite end of the pool is a World War II memorial built in honor of the greatest generation. Near the Lincoln Memorial on one side you find the Korean War Memorial and on the other side you find the Vietnam War Memorial honoring the service and sacrifice of the millions who have served in those two conflicts. Our veterans came from a full range of backgrounds and values but they all shared a few things in common. Within each of them burned a love of freedom and the moral courage to safeguard it. With a career soldier or citizen soldier, they all answered the call to duty and they shouldered the responsibility of guarding freedom in its darkest hours. When tyrants and dictators threatened to extinguish it, how great and noble was their sacrifice. I know many of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. Without a doubt, the film has left a lasting impression on this generation regarding the debt that we owe to previous generations. The film, if you saw it, opens with the harrowing realistic reenactment of the D-Day invasion of Normandy. 
we see the action through the eyes of Captain John Miller, played by Tom Hanks. And through the rest of the film, Miller leads a search party to locate Private Ryan, whose three brothers have just been killed in action. The last and the only surviving son is to be sent home to his grieving mother. As the soldiers penetrate behind enemy lines, they open a Pandora's box of moral questions. Why are these eight called to risk their lives to save one man? Don't they have mothers too? Are they just some pawns and some cynical PR maneuver by the War Department? And how much is one man's life worth? There are no easy questions, there are no easy answers to those questions, but in the end, we see the only one possible. Miller and most of his men have been mortally wounded. And as the captain dies, he grabs Private Ryan and pulls him close to his face. And in his last breath, he says, earn this, live a good life, earn this. In other words, men have died for you. Now live a life worthy of such sacrifice. What a weight of moral duty to lie on one man's shoulders. And yet 50 years later, the former Private Ryan, now an old man, visits the soldier graves in Normandy. And with tears in his eyes as he runs up to Captain Miller's tombstone, he cries, I lived my life the best I could. I hope in your eyes, I have earned what you have done for me. So today we celebrate the service and the sacrifice of those who have served our nation. Each veteran service is no less than what was laid on the altar of freedom by their predecessor. By raising their right hand to serve their country, each veteran knows that there are some things worth dying for. Whether it is country, whether it's democracy, or liberty, or the ability to worship as we choose without fear of prejudice or persecution. Each knows the risks to our nation and our citizens, and each of them knows the sacrifice that's necessary to preserve it. Much like those past generations, today's generation of young Americans understand the implications of what is at stake and have answered freedom's distress call. The so-called pundits that cite America as a declining power have not witnessed this generation in action. Rest assured, I have seen their courage, their intelligence and determination firsthand. And I can promise you that America's future is in very good hands. The simple fact that America is able to produce such a magnificent and dynamic generation is proof positive that this country's brightest days still lay ahead of it. And when I hear those who complain about what's wrong with America, I invite them to reflect on this generation and who they really are. Our service members today, sometimes referred to as the 9-11 generation, represent the very best of America. They are a generation of men and women that saw our nation brutally attacked and yet they volunteered to serve, knowing full well that they would be sent into harm's way to confront the enemies of our nation on obscure battlefields halfway around the world. Yet they never wavered or questioned. They quietly count themselves worthy to stand among generations of Americans that have gone before them, quietly standing in the gap between the evils of the world and the values of our nation and our Constitution and the American people. Many in this country don't fully understand the incredible value and impact of this 9-11 generation that they're having right now and will continue to have on our society, but that's okay, because they would not want it any other way. For they're a humble, resilient, and focused generation. President George H.W. Bush said, if anyone tells you that America's best days are behind her, they're looking the wrong way. I truly believe that our nation's best days are ahead of us because of the incredible men and women of this generation who wear the cloth of our nation who say every day, send me. 
allow me to share a couple stories of soldiers that I believe epitomize what I'm talking about. About six years ago when I was a division commander in Iraq on Easter Sunday morning, I stood in the corner of the operating room of our combat support hospital at our base in northern Iraq, watching Private Brandon Morocco, a native of Staten Island, received 56 pints of blood to keep his body alive. Brandon lost all four of his limbs when an IED hit him on the driver's side of his vehicle, as well as two inches from his jugular vein in his neck. Soldiers were lined up all night answering the call to donate a pint of blood just to save their buddy. We didn't know if Brandon would make it. But six weeks later, during my R&R &R leave, I stopped by the Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C. to see him. And there sat an energetic, spunky Brandon Morocco, surrounded by his family, telling me he was going to walk off the plane to meet his platoon when they returned from Iraq. And sure enough, six months later, Brandon flew to Honolulu to, to join his unit in the Welcome Home celebration. His platoon all had gate side passes, and instead of him meeting his platoon, the platoon got there first and they went to that airport to meet him. After everyone else got off the plane, down the ramp came Brandon Morocco with two prosthetic legs and two prosthetic arms, walking into the cheering arms of his buddies in the platoon. I also had the honor several years ago to meet Major Scotty Smiley first blind soldier to remain on active duty. Scotty lost his eyesight in 2005 when a suicide car bomb exploded in front of his striker vehicle when he was standing in the commander's hatch in Mosul, Iraq. Despite that, Scotty went on to command a company of soldiers at West Point and taught leadership to the cadets in his free time. But quite frankly, he didn't really have to teach leadership. All he had to do was to show up. Scotty was also selected as the Army Times Soldier of the Year. He won an SB in 2008 as the best outdoor athlete. He completed an MBA at Duke University, and he had spoken to motivate Coach Mike Brzezinski's Olympic Dream Team. He's climbed Mount Rainier and surfaced in Hawaii. And today, he's an assistant professor of military science in Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. And this past summer, Scotty completed an Ironman triathlon in Idaho. And from Batesburg, Leesville, and Lula, South Carolina, Sergeant Major Thomas P. Payne recently received our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor, from President Trump for rescuing 70 hostages being held by ISIS in the prison compound in the town of Hawija in northern Iraq. In constant enemy fire and in smoke and fire, Sergeant Major Payne repeatedly went in and out of buildings to breach four to five prisons and to rescue the 70 POWs. So where do you find such men and women? Where does a nation find such selfless service and sacrifice? The fact is that we find them right here among you the great American people, in communities all across this great land, from neighborhoods in the five boroughs of New York City to farmlands in Kansas and Iowa, to quiet coastal towns and villages in New England, in the Pacific North, Northwest, the mountain homes of Colorado, the desert homes of the Southeast, and right here in Florence, South Carolina. From small towns to major metropolitans, you'll find them with the desire to serve and to stand in the gap when their nation needed them the most. Without your loyalty and support of our service members and their families and the values of our nation, we could never put together such a military as we have today and accomplish the incredible and challenging missions that are given to them each and every day. I'd like to leave you with one brief thought. One that sums up the reason so many of us are gathered here today and in ceremonies such as this throughout the United States. And that thought is this, that our shared value and our shared belief that America is 
the greatest nation in the world. The reason for this belief is very simple. It's because of the brave men and women, including many of you here today, that have stood up to be counted when freedom was threatened and sacrificing, sacrificing so much in the process. In closing, I ask that we all remember all of our service members and our first responders who have paid the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our nation. We are forever indebted to them for their service and their sacrifice. May we always be worthy of their sacrifice. Or to echo the words of Private Ryan, I hope that we have earned what they have done for us. May we also remember those that are at this very moment standing watch for us around the globe in the name of freedom and democracy. And may God bless each and every one of you here today. And may God continue to bless the United States of America and the great state of South Carolina. Thank you very much.